Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. It's painful to think back to 50 years ago in the Bronx, which would take us back to 1972 and 73, and the era, era when in plain language the Bronx was burning. It was a time when the Bronx was the poster child for all that was wrong with urban living, but now, in the words of one of tonight's guests, our borough is a model for urban recovery and revitalization. And it can't be denied that an important part of that changed narrative is an organization that was merely known as the Citizens Advice Bureau, now called Bronx Works, that was committed for the long haul to definitively change that narrative by helping individuals and families improve their economic and social well-being. From toddlers to seniors, Bronx Works feeds, shelters, teaches, and supports our Bronx neighbors to build a stronger Bronx community. And tonight, here on Bronx Talk, a bit of a celebration. It's CAB Bronx Works has turned 50. So please join me in welcoming Bronx Works Assistant Executive Director, John Weed. Nice to see you, John. Thank you. Nice to see and you. And the Director of Development is Ken Small. Ken, nice to see you again. Both of you have been, on the, <clears throat> excuse me, have been on the program before. Yes. Um, John, let's just start with you. Um, Coming, I started by talking about the Bronx, the South Bronx especially, was burning. Um, how did uh, Bronx, well, at that time, Citizens Advice Bureau get started? That was in, as I understand, a direct response to what are we going to do now? That's right. Um, so we started in a storefront on the Grand Concourse, 2070 Grand Concourse. So it was about right around the Burnside, Burnside. Uh, okay. cross, cross section there. And um, we started on a model um, from uh, England, actually, where it was really? in information referral. Yeah, so yeah, the yeah. Citizens Advice Bureau was a place where people could come in for any sort of information and then get, get a referral. So in the early years, we were working largely with seniors who were residents of these burned out buildings. And we would help them with information referral, whether it was uh, housing relocation, benefits, and we still have that model today, and we're still operating uh, that model from about four different sites. When you were talking about that, I was just thinking, I said, you know, there's like the foundation. There's housing, and there's uh, working with seniors, working with vulnerable populations. Well, if you ask me what does Bronx Works do now, that's, that's what you do. Um, was there something learned from that era that you philosophically you or your colleagues take with you now into to the current day? Yeah, I think, um, you know, certainly we've done benefits for the past 50 years and we've helped people, uh, immigrants who are new to the community to uh, orient themselves to the community and we still do that. And um, housing, benefits, uh, programs in communities, that's really our, our strength. You know, both of these um, gentlemen have been on Bronx Talk before. It's nice to know that John Weed was one of our first guests, I guess like the 10th show we ever did. <laughs> seems like yesterday. <laughs> seems like it was in January 1995. Oh, boy. And it was, but, but um, so he did a show with us in 95 on domestic violence and senior citizens. And Ken, you were here <laughs> to talk about budgets in 2009, right. after school programs in 2012, a blueprint for neighborhoods in 2013. It occurred to me that that's the menu. Those, those are the items, uh, a lot of the items uh, that you do. Right. Um, you're in development. We were just talking before, and you were talking about um, the difficulty in, in, in raising money. Right. Um, how does Bronx Works or the Citizens <laughs> Advice Bureau sustain itself? Are these government contracts? Are these donations? Are these collaborative efforts with corporations? Or did I just list how you survive all would, of the above? I, I would say, Gary, it's, it's all of the above. And in particular, in terms of Bronx Works funding, the lion's share comes from government contracts. Uh, we work very closely with many city, state, as well as, uh, to some extent, federal government agencies. But we do have collaborations and partnerships that entail work with foundations, corporations, and entities like the United Way. So on the funding end, it's a, it's a broad mix. It's a mosaic. But the mix is, <laughs> the mix is heavily uh, government funding. 
Uh, is it, if you do a line graph on difficulty, would you say, well, it was very difficult then and now less difficult to raise money now? Or is it more difficult then, and you know, or has it been like a roller coaster depending on what's out there and what's going? On? I, I, you know, what I'm getting yeah. at is, do do the funders of all sorts understand finally <laughs> the need mm -hmm. uh, that's out there that Bronx Works addresses? I, I think in some ways, Gary, it's a bit easier now for Bronx Works to secure. Funding, and I say that in part because of the reputation of the organization. So, oftentimes, if the city government, for example, has a new initiative, they may come to Bronx Works and say, "Look, this is something that we'd like to pilot. We've got so good relations with you. Um, let's see what can happen. And if it works well for Bronx Works, perhaps this becomes something that we look to roll out." in terms of other city government agencies as well. And, and I'd add to that, Gary, the fact that we rebranded ourselves, I think that's helped tremendously in terms of Bronx Works being able to fundraise. Uh, we're going to get to that in a moment. I did want to get to this. This is um, South Bronx Battles, and the reason I wanted to bring it up is it was written by Carolyn McLaughlin. It, it, it really exists as a wonderful history, not only of Citizens Advice Bureau and Bronx Works, but of the Bronx in general and how things happen or not happen mm -hmm. uh, all along the way. Um, John, let's just talk about the leadership. Carolyn and, of course, now Eileen Torres for a few decades. Um, talk about what they contributed and what their vision was like uh, to run the thing for 50 years. A lot of hard work. Carolyn was extremely hardworking. Eileen is equally hard, hardworking. And they both have visions for the future. So it's not just the here and now. It's where will Bronx Works be in five years? Where will CAB be in five years? And um, I think both of them really were extremely important. Uh, Eileen is extremely important now, Carolyn then. Um, and... Um, I credit her for, for a lot of hard work over the years. I guess in, in, in many ways um, they're pioneers um, and leaders because they envisioned this or they looked at our society and they said, yeah. you know what, in order to make this work, we're going to need to do this. Absolutely. And yeah. the amount of growth that uh, CAB had and mm -hmm. Bronx Works has been having over the past years, it's, you know, it could scare one, right? So... Um, with their hard work and their vision, being able to harness that growth and being able to help the number of people that we do per year is, is pretty awesome. I want to ask both of you about this. Ken referred to the transition in talking about Citizens Advice Bureau. I thought it was interesting. You said it was a British model. I was never yes. aware yeah. of that. Um, and then it became Bronx Works. So... Um, you know, you, you've now got that building on the Grand Concourse. You didn't always have that. Right. I believe that I visited you, was it on 149th Street that you had in the office? Or was that the Grand Concourse? Grand Concourse on 100, near 166. 166? Yeah. So, so let's, let's just talk about that transition, um, the acquisition of the old uh, Girls Club building. Yes. And how it became, that, that's the building people can see right now. And then that became the Citizens Advice Bureau's home. That's How right. did that impact the growth and development of the organization? Tremendously. Really? Um, really. Um, I mean, that building had been in the neighborhood for since 1926, actually. Right. And it had gone through various owners. We took it over in 1993. We merged with the Girls Club in New York. Um, it was a tremendous asset for us at that time. The building was largely empty when we took it over, and we were able to fill it with programs. It's so uh, much utilized today that we really have no more space for, oh. for, for, for additional programs. All right. And you know what? Developers, a, look out. They may be, <laughs> we may have, need more space. Uh, but it's, it's a perfect uh, building. It's got a pool. It's got a gymnasium. We started our youth programs there. Um, it, 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 it really um, has been a tremendous asset for us. Uh, Ken, then let's just talk about the... the what the building added from a programming standpoint. Mm -hmm. I mean, he touched on them, but what does it give you the opportunity to do that maybe CAB didn't do in the past? And you said, of course, fundraising a little easier. Just talk a little bit about well, the growth of the organization. I, I think what, the, what had been the Girls Club building 
1130 Grand Concourse, which we renamed the McLaughlin Community Center. What oh, it's, I wasn't even aware of that. What, what it's done for our organization is it's given us an anchor location, a place where no matter how young you are or how young at heart you are, you can come and receive services. So in that space, there's programming for everything from a preschool effort on through to services for seniors. So I think it was really critical for Bronx Works as an organization to have an anchor site. And that's what the McLaughlin Center, that's what 1130 Grand Concourse gave us. You know, we've flagged this uh, as a turning point in the 50 years, you know, that this mm -hmm. was a moment. Are there other turning points? Are there other things? I mean, we don't have to get to COVID yet and the <laughs> asylum seekers, which right. we'll get to in a minute. But along the way, have there been other turning points? Well, that was really the, the main one, was moving CAB well, to, to be done. Yeah, I would say before that, yeah. um, uh, where we started our, our growth, really, um, was when the city was um, RFPing out uh, senior centers, homeless shelters. So um, in the beginning, um, you know, the, the city would run a senior center. Right. But then, and I think it would have been in the 19, early 1990s when they said, well, we shouldn't be running senior centers anymore. Let's, let's get, let's export it out to a, a nonprofit. So at that time, we got three senior centers. And we started r running homeless shelters, and and so it was. It was at that point in the early '90s when citizens of Vice Bureau started expanding um, greatly. And then when we got the Girls Club building in 1993, kind of crystallized. All yes, of that. yes, because we developed child care center there. Mm -hmm. We renovated uh, rooms for um, you know uh, youth after activities. school and and youth programs, workforce development, ESL. Right now we have Saturday programs. Mm -hmm. uh, we have food pantries there, and that was a growth out of the pandemic, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, right now the building is used heavily Thanks. six days a week. We have a soccer club in there on Sunday, so it's 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 tremendous how much the building is actually being utilized. At the 40th anniversary, so that would be you do the math. It's 10 <laughs> years ago. Um, there was a video. You guys participated in a video. Right. I wanted to show people to get a sense. Of, of just of the whole thing. So um, if uh, Rebecca will play the magic wand and you can see this is Bronx Works 10 years ago, but you'll see the dialogue is the same as the one we're having right here. Right. So a um, little applause for Bronx Works. <laughs> I was introduced to Bronx Works when it first opened. Right here at the corner of 181st and the Grand Concourse, they opened up a little storefront which was Citizen Advice Bureau, and my neighbor was one of their employees. And she said, Sally, go. They were giving out the smoke detectors, and that's what introduced me to Bronx work, that smoke detector. I started at Bronx Works in 1979. There was this paid staff of two, myself and one other. A lot of the work we did was housing related. People would come in with housing problems. Uh, we still served a lot of senior citizens then. They provided so many services for people in the community, as far as housing, health, anything that they needed help with. We would have seniors who would be the only person left in their building. We help people get benefits and relocate into other buildings that were safer. Anytime anybody wanted to find out anything, they would come to me, Sally, well, what can I do here? I said, you have to go to the Citizen Advice Bureau. You have to go to the Citizen Advice Bureau. I was born and raised in the South Bronx in the Hunts Point community. I clearly remember having a go directly to school come directly back home because you didn't want to interact with no one on the street because you never know where it may lead you. And I've seen the transition from when the Bronx was burning to now the Bronx is blooming is how we like to refer to it. Well, there you go. There you can see. Now, now we've gotten almost to the modern day now. 
Um, can uh, the last 10 years uh, a bigger challenge than in the past? Of course, there's COVID. Um, there's all kinds of things. We're going to put up a list in a minute of all the, not all the things, but many of the things. That, but have the last 10 years, so that, that took us up to the 40-year mark. But what have the last 10 years been like? I think the last 10 years have been interesting in the sense that there are the challenges that we had for many, many years, but there are new challenges that are associated with new populations and challenges that are associated with new geographic areas. So over the course of the last 10 or so years, when you take a look at who Bronx Works serves, uh, there was a point in time where very few folks came, say, from the West African immigrant community. Uh, now we have a significant West African immigrant population that we serve. And that's consistent. So that meant that you had to conform yeah. programs yeah, to that right. culture. That, that's, that's consistent the with the, the changes in the Bronx demographics. And, and John, you, you work, obviously, the higher administrative staff. You do that. You look at a population and say, well, now we, we've got Africans who are coming. That's in, right. And, and so, you do conform that. That's one. Yeah. That's right. And the, and, and the Bronx has changed quite a bit demographically, uh, uh, not only West African, but uh, Bangladesh. South Asian, um, and a many different uh, Latino um, uh, groups, right? So in the beginning, when I started, right. uh, back in the 1990s, it was largely Puerto Rican, Dominican. Now, now there's, you know, the, the demographics have changed quite a bit, and it's right. very diverse. Uh, which, of course, means challenge for all, so, all social service mm -hmm. providers. Right. Um, you, you folks on your website has a list from 2021 of all, I, I want to show that just so we can mm -hmm. put our arms around how large the scope is. Um, so this was uh, 2021, uh, they provided, I, I want you to think of this, provided food for 870,000 meals. Do you realize what that is, folks, and what it takes with the organization to do that? 1,900 participants in nutrition workshops, 197 homeless people were put into permanent housing, 19,000 people were given rental assistance, right. thousands of children in early learning, after school, academic enrichment, and summer youth employment. I ain't done yet, okay? <laughs> uh, and um, uh, then, you know, then there's basic inc income tax prep, health insurance enrollment, mental health support, financial literacy. This is, this is what you folks do. Now, right. now we're going to say this is what you do, and you had told me you serve annually between 60,000 60 and 65,000 people. people. Yeah. So in 2020, COVID hits. Mm -hmm. And the populations that were most vulnerable <clears throat> were most vulnerable in, in the worst ways. Right. People died. And then, of course, trying to live with it. Um, what did it mean? What did you have to do? Like all organizations, you had to pull back where you needed more funding. I mean, right. just talk a little bit about what you needed to do. So we... Mm -hmm. We pivoted uh, in certain areas. Uh, food insecurity became a very big factor during the pandemic, and we opened several food pantries, which we still operate till today. Um, because the need, unfortunately. The need has not, has not decreased, and the right. need it has probably always been there, but it was highlighted more during the pandemic for some reason. And so we were able to fund um, six different uh, food pantries, uh, mm -hmm. one of which is at the McLaughlin Center that operates on Saturdays. And we're serving 225 uh, families per Saturday when we operate that pantry. I, I want people to do that on your fingers and count how many people that is coming through the doors. So and we have staff coming in. They come in at 8 o'clock. They set up. And then they provide food until 3 o'clock. So right. it's a it's a it's a real endeavor. The other thing is is job loss during the pandemic. Right. I think the oh. Bronx saw about twenty five percent unemployment See, rate. And, and it, let me just yeah. interject: if you have a real organization that really serves and not just has programs that are good programs, but then you've got to figure out. Well, now we got to deal with that. That's right. right. So we have a workforce uh, workforce development department, and they have been busy at providing jobs for for people. You know, since the pandemic started. Uh, but another thing that we did was we uh, sponsored a, a, a clinic, a vaccine clinic with Somos. And right. one week we saw 4,000 people in our building to get vaccines. I'm very proud of that. 4,000 uh, 
thousand, again, think of the numbers. I would get there at 7 in the morning, and the line would be around the, wow. around the block. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we never met the need completely because... Oh, uh, but then we, we continued to operate a vaccine clinic for, for several months um, on site. Ken, you can't do this without great staff. Right? True. Right? True. Talk, talk about people who work there and their dedication. I mean, we we, well, we understand. We've talked a long time. We understand yeah. some of these issues, but you must have a, a lot of really good people that work there. You know, Bronx Works has a thousand staff overall. A thousand. And, yeah, and 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 I always say to folks that coming to work for Bronx Works, you come with passion. You come with a willingness to commit to the work of the organization. It's not just a job, and to borrow from an old cliche, it really is an experience. And you do the work, you get into the work, you embrace the work, you you do it on behalf of the people who call the Bronx home. So it, it's not just a job. It really is doing the work that's important to fulfill needs. I'll ask both of you about this. Uh, we were talking before the show about affordable housing and the need for affordable housing. I, I mentioned to you, and I'm going to mention to everybody now, that the, the thing is, well, okay, we're building affordable housing, and it's going to be supportive of affordable housing, so there's going to be um, other um, you know, uh, facilities and other mm -hmm. programs, but then who, who runs those programs? They don't come from, from the sky. So um, can Bronx Works runs those programs, right? In Bronx, many Bronx Works has been a provider in terms of supportive housing, and also in terms of things like NYCHA with respect to NYCHA beginning its process of having partnerships with the private sector. So one of the things that's happening now in terms of the New York City Housing Authority is NYCHA is looking at collaborations, collaborations that involve private real estate developers, property management companies. But an important part of that also is the critical role for social service providers. Because and, and you, Bronx you Works just has can't, been doing that. You know, and Bronx Works has identified this all along the way. Mm -hmm. You just can't bring people you know, in without that sort of thing. Um, John, you were telling me beforehand about Bronx Point. Everybody in the Bronx is excited about this. It's going to be affordable housing. We'll have the Hip Hop Museum there. It's right That's down right. the block from the Children's Museum. I mean, it's going to be a really wonderful um, a project. Who's providing the support? So Bronx Works, <laughs> we will be there. Um, uh, uh, Eileen and I uh, did a walkthrough the other day. It's coming to completion. It'll be completed sometime in September. We're going to operate a three-classroom child care center there. We'll also have supportive housing uh, for tenants there. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's an exciting project. Um, another um, wrinkle, like, oh, here, Bronx Works, go deal with this. We have asylum seekers. We have thousands of them uh, yes. in the city. Have you uh, had to conform in some form or reform your, your programs or take them in? Have well, you this was, to provide services? This was uh, an area uh, that Ken mentioned before where the city will come to us and ask us to provide a service. We're running a shelter uh, currently in the North Bronx uh, for asylum seekers. We're also developing an ESL component for those asylum seekers right. so that they can learn English. Um, and we've gotten funding from the Robin Hood Foundation for that. Uh, has, has that process started already? Yes. Uh, how's it been? I, I think people have hear about them, they know that they somehow are infiltrated into our the families uh, communities? The families moved in in August. Uh, they've settled in, uh, and uh, most of them have stayed there ever since. We're working with them. We're working with the city to to improve their lives, and, and now, you like know, just... Like you do with to, everybody else. That's right. Um, Ken, you ever... Uh, maybe this is the <laughs> moment. Did you ever get the time to sit back and say, well, um, look, look at... And consider all that you've done because every day I, I don't want to use the word selling, but you're you're promoting um, Bronx Works. Right. Um, uh, just just tell me, do you, ever, do you ever sit back and say, "Wow, look at, look at what"? Because I'm having that <laughs> reaction right now. Mm -hmm. well, do you ever do that? I I think some of my moments of greatest pleasure have been when I've gone to say the McLaughlin Center, and I have a chance to visit the early learning program or I have a chance to go to where an ESL class is taking place, or just to go to the gym 
and see that space being used by by young people, sometimes being used by adults who take a break during during their lunch. Uh, and so for me, just the experience of being able to see the results of what we do in terms of, you know, from my vantage point, it's do what you can in order to raise funds, but you really get an opportunity to see what those funds do when you visit spaces like the McLaughlin so that makes Center. It, it, it makes you feel better. It makes you say, well, okay, I guess it's worth all the what we put into. John, what about you? Do you have a chance to sit back and say, wow, look at this. <laughs> I mean... 870,000 meals? <laughs> that's right. The, the wonderful thing about working at Bronx Works is that we have many programs. You get to see the, the clients who come in, the participants, and um, I'm right in that building, that CMCC, the McLaughlin building. So I see the youth, I see the food pantry, I see uh, the ESL, and I'm in the early childhood. I see those things every day, and it's a joy to, to work within that environment. Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, on behalf of BronxNet Television and um, Bronx Talk, um, and, and our association all over the years. Uh, we've consulted on all kinds of issues with you and with other people on the staff. Um, it's, it's just wonderful um, what you do. We couldn't survive without you. There's a gala coming in May. I mean, there's going to be a year-long celebration. There'll be all kinds of things. Um, so we have a little surprise for you. <laughs> it's a birthday, right? It's a birthday. Here we go. So we brought cupcakes for all the boys, and we're going to let you, we're going to do, we're going to do happy birthday. Happy birthday to Bronx Works. On behalf of Bronx Works. On behalf of Bronx Works. We'll let, I don't know if we're going to set up the sprinklers in here. It would be the first time, so we'll give you one to blow out, say a good wish for, for, um, uh, and very good frosting. Thanks to our friends at Garden Gourmet in the Bronx. I want to say a little wish for Bronx Works on a happy birthday. Happy to birthday. another 50 years. Yes. Another 50 years. All right. All right. Well, there you go. Uh, happy birthday to uh, John Weed and uh, Ken Small and all the and people. And to Bronx Works. And to Bronx Works. Blow it out there. We don't want to burn down the place. Thank you so much. Uh, listen, um, congratulations to Eileen and to all my friends over there. Um, and thanks here. Uh, to our producer, Rebecca Hammett, great job today with all the pictures and everything. Our director, Nick Marrero, uh, the cast of thousands who are here working with us in the studio. I see that our executive director, Michael Max, is here. Come on, Michael, don't be shy. Never shy. But I know he supports everything. Yes. And we'll say goodnight. And uh, come on, come on, go. Come behind me. That's the way. Rod's proud. <laughs> That's it.